All right, so here they're asking which of the following statements is incorrect, okay? And look at the statements. All of these statements are from the chapter Atomic Structure. They are talking about absorption spectra and emission spectra. So let's read the statement. We'll quickly move through this question. We're not going to waste a lot of time here. We'll mark true or false. Whatever is false is going to be the right answer to this question, okay? So here... Your first statement is talking about emission spectra. So it says emission spectra occur when, occurs when electrons lose their energy and return from a higher energy state to a lower energy state. Okay, fine. So here what is happening? They are saying that you have the nucleus here, right? You have some energy levels as such. And the electron, when it is here, and it gets de-excited, right? It gets de-excited. So it releases some energy and when you pass this through a prism or when you take an image of these uh, wavelengths on a photographic plate then you can see that these lines will correspond to something that we call what that we call the emission spectrum okay cool so this statement is absolutely true more about the emission spectrum in the coming options okay now, option B is saying, option B is saying, uh, absorption spectra occurs when electrons gain energy and jump to higher energy states, uh, higher energy states from lower energy states. This is also true, right? We know that this is true. We know that absorption spectrum occurs when your electron gets excited and then when you take, a, when you take an image of, you know, the leftover light, then you get an absorption spectrum. Okay, this statement is true. There's not much to explain here. Then we have option C says emission spectra consist, sorry, emission spectra consist of continuous spectra of bright colored light. Okay, no, this is false. Okay, this statement is false. Emission spectrum, like look at this example here, right? This is a very generic example. So when the electron gets uh, de-excited, for one de excitation, you will have one wavelength corresponding. You will have one energy corresponding, right? Similarly, if I say that this electron is jumping from here to here and then from here to here. Now, here you will have one, two and three. You will have three different wavelengths, okay? So, for a given electron or for a given atom, you will see that there are only certain wavelengths that exist. Apart from that, your entire plate your entire photographic plate is going to be black. So basically you have a black background on which you have some colored lines and that is your absorption spectrum. It is not a continuous spectrum. It is called a line spectrum. Okay. So uh, in other words, what you can call it is bright lines on a dark background. This is your line spectrum. Okay. Cool. Now you have last one option D says absorption spectra consist of dark lines separated by colored space. Yes, this statement is true. Basically, what happens with an absorption spectrum is that your entire photographic plate has color because only very few wavelengths are missing. You have more of a band spectrum there and you have an entire surface of color where you have certain dark lines. Okay, so it is basically... Uh, the negative of a emission spectrum okay so what can we say we can say that the absorption spectrum looks like dark lines on a bright background and absorption spectrum looks like bright lines on a dark background okay statement is absolutely true we have only one false statement which means option c which is the false statement is going to be the right answer to this question Okay, so here they're saying energy required to dissociate 4 grams of gaseous hydrogen into free gaseous atoms is 208 kilocalories at 25 degrees. Okay, the bond energy, the bond energy of HH bond per mole will be what? So basically they're saying that if you take 4 grams of gaseous hydrogen, right, gaseous hydrogen is nothing but H2. So you take 4 grams of H2 and you supply 208 kilocalories of energy to this H2. And as a result of which, what happens? You get 4 grams of gaseous hydrogen atoms. This is what your question is telling you. Fine. You need to find out what will be the bond energy of the HH bond per mole. Okay. See, very first thing, you know that 
वी हैव टू फाइंड आउट द मोलर मास ऑफ एच टू सो मोलर मास ऑफ एच टू इज गोइंग टू बी टू इंटू वन विच इज नथिंग बट सॉरी टू ग्राम पर मो ओके दिस इज द मोलर मास ऑफ एच टू विच मीन्स इन फोर ग्राम्स आई बेसिकली हैव टू मोल्स टू मोल्स ऑफ हाइड्रोजन गैस ओके आई मीन दिस पार्ट राइट the initial part that we are starting off with not the free gaseous atoms okay i mean molecular hydrogen so you have two moles of molecular hydrogen in uh in 4 grams correct now you need to find out the bond energy of hh a uh, bond per mole which means what which means you need to calculate so for two moles it was 208 calories sorry 208 kilo calories for one mole how much will it be simple unitary method right 208 by 2 104 kilo calories this is going to be your answer so where do you have that you have that in option a so option a 104 kilo calories is going to be the right answer to this question all right so here they are asking you which of the following reactions will have a negative value of delta s so basically delta s less than 0 where do you have such a thing going on basically if you have any certain reaction where your number of moles number of moles before the reaction is greater than the number of moles after the reaction then your entropy change will become negative because as your reaction proceeds forward stoichiometrically speaking your entropy will decrease fine this is what we want so let's see option a h2o liquid gives you h2o gas so you have one mole of h2o liquid giving you one mole of h2o gas in this case entropy is going to increase because it went from liquid state to gaseous state although the number of moles is same gases have more entropy correct so this is going to have delta s greater than 0 then Let's see. Option B. Two SO two plus O two is giving you two SO three. So before the reaction, you have three moles. After the reaction, you have two moles. You can see that the number of gaseous moles is reducing. So from three, it went to two. So the entropy reduced, which means entropy change is negative. Okay. Then you have option C. Cl two is giving you two Cl. Okay. So basically, uh, you have chlorine gas this is giving you free gaseous chlorine atoms and here you have one mole giving you two moles which means what which means that your delta s is going to be less than um sorry delta s is going to be greater than 0 because your number of gaseous moles have increased thereby increasing entropy now option d calcium carbonate solid is giving you calcium oxide solid plus carbon dioxide gas okay solid is giving you solid plus gas yes entropy is increasing simply by looking at the reaction don't even have to balance or think about if it is balanced or look at the stoichiometric coefficients solid is giving you solid plus gas gas is there yes yes entropy is increasing so your delta s here is going to be greater than 0 which means here option b is the only one where delta s is less than 0 okay and option b is going to be the right answer to this question All right. So here they're saying that for the equilibrium at 27 degrees Celsius, LiCl dot 3 NH3 solid is dissociating to give you LiCl dot NH3 solid plus 2 NH3 gas. Kp is equal to 9 atmosphere square. Okay. A 24.63 liter flask contains uh, contains one mole of LiCl dot NH3. How many moles of NH3 should be added to the flask at this temperature to drive the backward reaction towards completion? Fine. So basically, what they're saying is, you have this reaction. You have LiCl dot three NH three is dissociating to give you LiCl dot NH three plus two NH three. Correct. This is the reaction. So they're saying that, uh, in a certain flask, a flask of a certain volume, you have. One mole of LiCl dot NH three. So this is your at time t is equal to zero. At time t is equal to zero. This is your condition that you have one mole of LiCl dot NH three and some n moles of NH three. We don't know how many moles. Okay. And you need to ensure that this reaction goes to completion. So for this reaction to go to completion, what do you know? The final condition has to be zero moles of LiCl dot NH three. And n minus two moles of NH three, right? Because whatever is your number of moles, minus two. Okay. Why do I need minus two? Because you need this and this to combine to give you 
LiCl dot three NH three. That is when you can say that your reaction has been completed. Okay, and I don't care about a lot of things. I just care about this component here because I have Kp given to me. And what is Kp? Kp is basically you find out the equilibrium constant in terms of partial pressure. And NH three is the only gas. Everything else is solid, which means they are not going to contribute to my Kp. So Kp here is going to be partial pressure of NH three squared. That's it. Okay. So I just care about NH three. Rest of it can just stay aside. I just have to find out this N. Okay. So Kp is given to me as nine, which means if I take a square root on both sides, I get partial pressure of NH three, or uh, is equal to three atm. This was nine atm square. Correct. So I got three atm. Now what will I do? I have the pressure. I have the temperature. I know gas constant. I know volume of the container. I can do PV is equal to N R T, right? And I can find out N. Once I find out N, um, once I find out N, then I can do N minus two, and I'll get my answer. Okay, great. So let's get started. Now, see, basically, you have PV is equal to N R T. Your pressure is three atm, so three. Multiplied by volume. Volume is twenty four point six three liters. Is equal to n. This is what we need to find out. R is your universal gas constant, which is not mentioned here, but in terms of liter atmosphere per mole Kelvin, we write it as point zero eight two one, which I'm going to approximate to one by twelve. And your temperature is given to us twenty seven degrees Celsius, which means this will be three hundred Kelvin. Okay. Now let's calculate n. What do we have for n? Okay, so basically I can cancel this out with three. I'll get a hundred here, and I'll cancel this out, and I'll get twenty-five here. Okay, so twenty-four point six three. I'm approximating it to twenty-five. So this and this can be cancelled. So your number of moles is equal to three. Okay, so to send the reaction to completion, I need basically n plus two moles. N plus two moles is nothing but three plus two. So three plus two is going to be five. Your answer here is option A, five moles. All right. So here they're saying the set representing the correct order of first ionization potential is going to be what? Okay. So very first thing, what is first ionization potential? It is the amount of energy required to take, let's say, some neutral gaseous isolated m, okay, and make it m plus plus electron. That is basically you are removing the most loosely bound electron, okay, from the valence shell of a neutral gaseous isolated atom. All right, this is what it is. Now, what do we know about the order of ionization potential? The order of ionization energy. Basically, one thing we know that as we go down the group, the size increases, due to which the effective nuclear pull on the outermost electron or the valence electron decreases, because of which we can say that the ionization energy decreases as we go down the group. Very important. Okay. Is there anything else? First, let's check for this. If there's anything else, anything else we need to consider, then we'll come back to it. First, you have potassium greater than sodium greater than lithium. Okay, so you have your first A group here: lithium, sodium, potassium. Right. So as you go down the group, ionization energy decreases, which means potassium will have the least, followed by sodium, followed by lithium. And your order suggested is the exact opposite. So this is a big no from our end. Okay, then let's see. You have beryllium, magnesium, calcium. You have your group two A elements here. So you have beryllium, magnesium, calcium. As you go down the group, ionization energy will decrease. So the order has to be beryllium greater than magnesium greater than calcium. Correct. And this is the order given. So option B is correct. Then you have a uh, boron greater than carbon greater than nitrogen. We'll come back to this in a bit. This is about the order across the period. Let's check option D. Um, germanium greater than silicon greater than carbon. So what happens here? You have you have group fourteen: carbon, silicon, and germanium. So as you go down the group, what happens? Ionization energy decreases. So maximum is going to be carbon, then silicon, then you will have germanium. This is going to be the order, and the order suggested here is the exact opposite. So let's not go with it. Now. You have, you have um, 
boron greater than carbon greater than nitrogen. So here the order that you need to consider is that as you go from left to right in a period, what happens is that the ionization energy increases because, see, you have the same number of shells, okay? So your uh, outer shell, your outermost shell is going to be the same in the same period. Like for third period, your outermost shell is going to be your 3s or 3p. Basically, it's going to be the third uh, principal quantum number, correct? Third energy level. So you have that. And in that, basically, you are simply adding electrons because of which the pull, the pull is going to increase, right? As you move from left to right. Why? Because the size of the nucleus is increasing, right? As you move from left to right, you are adding one, one proton and accordingly more neutrons to the nucleus. So the pull of the nucleus begins to increase as you move from left to right in a period. Right? So left to right in a period, your ionization energy is going to increase. There are exceptions, yes, of course, but the general trend is that the ionization energy will increase. Now, you have boron, carbon and nitrogen. So what I want you to look at is that boron has atomic number 5, carbon has 6 and nitrogen has 7, correct? So what happens here is that boron has um, 1s2, 2s2, 2p1, carbon has 1s2, 2s2, 2p2 and nitrogen has 1s2, 2s2, 2p3, okay? So here, the minimum ionization energy is definitely going to be that of boron, okay? Boron is going to have the least ionization energy because it has one electron in the 2p subshell where if I remove that, it will attain a very stable configuration. It will have 1s2, 2s2, which is fully filled subshell, so it will have a stable configuration. So boron greater than carbon, that itself is incorrect. Boron will be the least. Then you have carbon, which will have intermediate energy. No problem with that. So at least I can flip this. Then you have nitrogen, 1s2, 2s2, 2p3. Nitrogen is going to have a very high ionization energy, very high ionization potential because it has stable electronic configuration. It has a partially filled subshell. It does not want to be disturbed. If you want to pull out one electron from here, you will have to struggle quite a lot, okay? So, which means, this is also incorrect. This is also going to be like this. Okay, so the order given to us is incorrect and hence option C is not going to be the right answer. Option B, beryllium greater than magnesium greater than calcium is the correct order of first ionization potential. 